and welcome to the Fertility Conversations podcast. The goal of this podcast is to create more awareness about infertility and to provide support to people trying to conceive. Thank you for listening today, and we hope you will be encouraged. And now, here is your host, Ola. Welcome to episode 21. Today I'm joined by a lovely guest, Okiki Marino. She's the founder of, and creative director of Okiki Marino, a fashion household brand name specializing in handcrafted leather handbags and fashionable clothing. Okiki is a fellow infertility warrior who has always spoken publicly about infertility in a bid to create more awareness in Nigeria. Okiki had three ectopic pregnancies which resulted in the loss of both her fallopian tubes. She endured four IVF cycles before welcoming her twins in 2016. Okiki is married and lives here in Nigeria. She can be reached on Instagram at Marinochi, and her details will also be in the show notes. So welcome Okiki and thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. Yay. So to start off, please tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do for fun? <laughs> what do I do for fun? That's a good one. These days, as an entrepreneur, I feel like we just mix work and fun. <laughs> exactly. So for fun, just literally, you know, catching up with friends, you know, um, take a bottle of wine, yeah. cheese, biscuits, some wow. meat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, meat is always good. Just lay back. <laughs> because um, you, for an entrepreneur, like, I feel like I'm walking literally all the time so fun nice. these days is really just chilling out like any time i can get to rest is a form of fun but on yeah. the real though um swimming i love swimming um I, I try and swim once a week you know i go for walks daily now eight kilometers a day oh, that's nice. yeah just yeah it's, yeah. So you know how fun before the COVID era would have entailed me going to a lounge or bar with mm -hmm. friends, but now we're all just, you know, managing the best we can. <laughs> yeah, we're becoming creative. So, yeah, become, <laughs> yeah, so. But at least it's it's making people connect more. That's why yes. I feel like in deeper ways, like exactly. all that busyness of life has slowed down. So you have time to go and visit that friend or that family member. That yeah. you've, you've been postponing, yeah, but in a safe way. <laughs> exactly. Try, trying to do it in a safe way, yeah. So that's, yeah, that's me. Sounds um, exciting, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, can you tell us about the time you, first time you met your husband? Oh, mm, good question. Um, I met my husband on a form of blind date in the ah, UK. Wow. In, in London, yeah. Um, we have so a friend of mine a girlfriend mm -hmm. um and his own guy friend they were friends and they both felt like we might be a good match so ah. both of them knew of him but i didn't know of him mm -hmm. so they they set it up you know and um yeah so it was, it was literally a, a blind date wow. so amazing. in the real sense of it but a fun fact about it was when i met him in person I mm -hmm. had seen him before, like a month before, at some house ah. in London. So it wasn't so you... that, so I didn't feel that much of a blank because I'd seen him. Uh -huh. He was trying to ask me questions about some other lady who right. he thought went to his um, university Unilag at the time. Okay. So he, so he saw that I knew that lady, that we all were friends. So mm -hmm. he was asking me questions with regards to that person, and I kept telling him that person did not go to Unilag. So because wow. I had a conversation with him, however short a month before, by the time I saw him a month later, I was like, oh my goodness, that yeah. guy, the, the one. Yeah. So, exactly. was, um, so were you checking me out? Were you checking him out the, the month before then when you were chatting? No, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. In fact, I remember teasing him that, oh, was he trying to chat me up, but yeah. didn't know how to go about it, you know. <laughs> And, but I think not. I think there was someone else he had desire. Ah, but then when <laughs> so he saw he you, he mm -hmm. me. He thought he could use me to get to that person, but it didn't work out since I didn't know him and none of us went to Unilag. So right. his, his plan fell short. But just mm -hmm. as well, so he now met me the month after. <laughs> exactly, and it all worked yeah. out. And it worked out, yes. Yeah. So in terms of being a mom, was there a particular yeah. time that you 
just thought, wow, yes, I would love to be a mom. Sir. Um, hmm, that, that's an interesting question, and I'm going to be frank. Um, I feel like that motherly, um, what's that maternal instinct, all that stuff, mm -hmm. I think it didn't, kick in, it didn't kick in for me for a long while. Um, I wasn't one of those people that used to dream about how many kids I would want. Mm -hmm. I, I, never, I don't even recollect a time like that in my younger years where I was projecting or oh, maybe being married and how many children. I, I was just living my own best life, you know, through those yeah. years, having fun, chilling. Um, yes, I didn't have much of a thought process. But at some point, I, I feel like my parents started getting a bit worried because they could <laughs> see that my attitude to the whole conversation with, with relations, even getting married, you won't see me having that very pushy attitude to it. I felt mm -hmm. like when it happens, it happens. But, but by age 26, 27, when they noticed uh, this lady is not even <laughs> trying to bring any man in yeah. a serious way, you know, everyone's just her friend, you know. So, so I feel like I first went through that whole thing of, okay, am I even getting married? So then I got married. So the truth is, thinking about how many children I want actually only started when I met this man that is now my husband. So when I met him during the dating years, he actually used to say he just wanted one child, just one. And I used to tease him that I think let's just have two, that two is okay. That like you don't mm -hmm. want one child to be bored and on their own and you know. Yeah. So he, he also was not really big on a big family. You know, and I wasn't that concerned either. You know, we just say, okay, one or two. Then I'll say, don't worry, we'll push for two, you know. So um, when we now got married, um, in the first year, or just under a year, because we got married in October 2010. And um, it wasn't till June 2011 that I actually got pregnant. But we were not trying. So from October okay. till around May, we, we were not trying at all. Mm -hmm. We were not trying for kids yet. We were just, you know, living our best lives being newlyweds. Yeah. So, but that was the plan. That was it. So we were now ready to start trying by May, you know, of the next year. And, um, and I got pregnant almost immediately. But let me know jump into that maybe you have questions for us before. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah but i mean that, that would be the next one we're going into basically uh -huh. asking you to tell us about your infertility journey from the beginning okay so yeah so exactly so i guess i've started it <laughs> yeah it's so, perfect, yeah, so yeah. June, june 2011 was when i found out i was pregnant for first ever time you know and um a few days after finding out i was pregnant I started spotting. Um, spotting means bleeding, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I went into, I went back to the doctor and I told them. And at that time, they immediately felt that I was having, that maybe it was an early miscarriage. That was what right. they felt. So they made me do like um, HCG test and all of that. But the HCG test was showing that it was rising. And so it was showing that there's still a pregnancy, you know, yeah. going on in my body. But I was still spotting. So eventually we'll do like a transvaginal check, you know. And when they go in, the first time they did it, they couldn't see any sign of a, of a fetus or what was it called, fetal pole in me whatsoever within the womb environment. Mm. But the person who did the check, I was later to find out, wasn't an actual gynecologist. It was probably just like a lab person. But at the same time, I want to believe that the person must know their own job. But I feel like if it was a proper gynecologist, they, they probably would have looked out for other signs of like, could this be an ectopic or, you right. know, because why should your HCG test be rising, but there's no sign of a baby anywhere. Mm -hmm. So in all the time I kept doing the HCG test and the transvaginal, I never actually knew that I wasn't seeing a gynecologist. I just mm -hmm. always assumed there was one, you yeah. know, because I, I had just moved back to Nigeria in, in 2010, and that was 2011, I was facing this plight. So I think I was still very new to how things are meant to be arranged medically, because I felt like if I was still in the UK, I don't need to tell them their job. They would have made exactly. sure the right person 
is doing the right thing and checking the right stuff. So I didn't know that Nigeria is a bit different, you know. So I, I was just always assuming that someone that knows what they're doing is checking me, you know. And they just kept saying, oh, there's no baby that you, that, that means you're miscarrying. So about, maybe about nearly nine weeks after the, this whole, I'm spotting, you're checking, you can't wow. see anything. Um, I now had like a very sharp excruciating pain that nearly made me pass out. And um, I remember it was on a Sunday. We were just having a relaxing Sunday at home. In fact, by then, my husband and I had accepted that I was miscarrying. So I was bleeding for nearly oh, maybe four weeks or so, four or five weeks after when I found out I was pregnant. You know, I was bleeding for like at wow. least a month. Yeah. But it was just little, 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 mm -hmm. you know. So I didn't think much of it. I thought, okay, maybe this is a slow miscarriage happening. So, and because the doctors themselves were playing it down, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't like they were saying, you know what, come in, let's check you in and find out, you know, what's going on. They just told me to go home and that it's the, the, the miscarriage will happen or some rubbish like that. So um, that day I got really bad pains and... Um, I told my husband, and so he now said, oh, that maybe this is the final bit of the miscarriage, you know, mm. like, since it was really, and my flow became so heavy. So we just assumed, we didn't even go to the hospital, it was a Sunday, I remember, because I was watching football, football Sunday. And um, it took me another three days, a Wednesday, to now going. And I was going to work, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I still went to my office. So after mm. work on Wednesday, I went to the hospital, and I said, I'm bleeding profusely. That if I continue like this, I might pass out. Like, I was really worried. Mm. So when they did the check on me that day, they knew that there was trouble. The doctor that did the check that day wasn't one I had seen in all the weeks leading to that day. Mm. It was the new doctor. So he now made me do, he now made me go and get um, a scan done. So I had to do that in another um, facility. Mm -hmm. So when I went to that facility, I got there and I gave them a doctor's note. This was around 8 p.m. at night. And I said to the security guy, I said, this is an emergency, apparently, that my doctor said I should tell you it's an emergency. And the security guy said they are closed for the night. But I let him go in and speak to the director, the owner of that facility, to say they need an urgent scan or whether he would answer. And they opened the gate pretty quickly. So that means whatever was written in that note must yeah. have been real emergency. So I went in and um, the, the doctor or director person in that facility, because it's, just, it's not a hospital, it's just one of those places that they do different checks and blood tests oh, and all of that. Okay. You know, yeah. Because the Patla Hospital I was going to, they didn't have that scan facility on the island, on the Koi axis. They okay. only had it in Apapa. And I was in, I said, okay, well, you rather VI, Victor Island, you know. I was on the island. I couldn't go to a papa at night, yeah. mainland, so late. At night. That was why I had to find somewhere local. Mm -hmm. So when the person at uh, this facility checked me, their own name is Crestview. They're, you know, I'm always speaking very highly of them, Crestview and BI. So when they checked, the guy was, um, he was really shocked to see what he was seeing. He said that, um, <laughs> that there was a dead fetus in me, like, you know, whatever I was carrying had died. He mm -hmm. could see a dead, yeah. And um, because of how big my stomach region was, he also felt like there must have been a lot of internal bleeding going on. So it literally showed him that there was an ectopic. He actually said that my whole inside was a mess and that they needed to operate immediately, like immediately. This is me in my work clothes, you know, <laughs> I was confused because I just came straight from work. <laughs> I wouldn't have known that that day I was going to be operated on or rather that night. So I called my husband who was still at work. He was a banker at the time. You know, they work late hours. And he now had to leave work and come and meet me. But we didn't tell him what was going on. I didn't want to frighten him. So when he came to Crestview, they now briefed him. So he was in a state of shock. Like, what do you mean she has to do surgery? He even wanted me to go to the UK. Like maybe the next day, just fly out. But yeah. they said that wouldn't be possible. 
that it's very dangerous, you know, that the fact that I was still alive was a miracle in itself because it was clear to see that one of my fallopian tubes had exploded and that was what was happening. Like yeah. everything was happening so fast, which is what an ectopic is. Ectopic is, you know, a fetus or a baby growing in the wrong place instead of your womb can grow in your, in your tube and other areas. In my case, it was growing in the tube. So when it grows too big, it will blow because the tube does not expand, you know. Right. Um, um, a fertilized egg is meant to swim through your tube and drop into your womb. But in my case, it got stuck in the tube and was growing in there, hence ectopic pregnancies. So ectopic pregnancies always have to be terminated. The earlier they find out that you are, you are going through an ectopic, the better, so that they terminate it because it can kill you. There have been people known to die from it. So um, in my case, it had exploded. So we had to get surgery done that night. In fact, an ambulance took me to the hospital in Apapa because, like I said, the, the access they had in VI, the branch they had, it was just like a GP type of arrangement. Their proper mm -hmm. hospital was on the mainland. So we entered an ambulance and they took me there and we did the operation that same night. Um, the operation was okay, you know. They got out all they needed to and clean me out. So I now had one fallopian tube left, right. you know. And uh, this thing happened June 2011. By December 2011, I was pregnant again. So this time around, because I knew that I was susceptible to ectopic pregnancies, we were checking more vigilantly, you know, we were on top of things. Yeah. But unfortunately, again, it was another ectopic pregnancy. But this time around, I was able to fly to the UK, you know, because I wanted to be in the UK, you know. So when I got there, they checked, they confirmed it was an ectopic, but it was early enough, you know, for it not to explode and all of that. Okay. So they, they, got, they got it out, you know, they sucked it out and they decided not to remove that Pascal fallopian tube. But what I explained to people is, though they didn't remove it, yeah. It still, it still caused um, a problem. Mm. It still, you know, because you, you've tampered it. Let's use that term. Yeah. The tube shouldn't be tampered. So they, they extracted it, left some of the tube, but they had, they had taken out of my tube. So it wasn't a fully functional tube anymore, mm. you know. So um, they got that out. So that was now the second topic. So they left that tube because they felt that I was still young enough. I think at the time I was about 29 and no kids yet. So they felt I was young enough to still be able to go and have a kid with the semi-surviving tube. So that was the way I ended December 2011. Two ectopics down, no babies, you know. 2012, zero sign of me getting pregnant. It just was not happening. January 2013, I now went to a clinic to get myself checked. Mm -hmm. So at this point, they were suggesting IVF already, even with the fact that I had, since my tube had been um, touched, you know, since it wasn't a fully functional tube, they felt that IVF was going to be one, one of the better options. Mm -hmm. So that was January 2013. So by April 2013, so I told them I'll go and think about it. April 2013, I got pregnant again. So I was so happy. And, I, and as a woman of faith, because I'm a Christian, I felt like, you know, that waiting period between January and April, that God wanted to show me that he was going to do it himself, you know, no yeah. problem. So May, in May of that year, May 2013, I went back to the UK immediately. When I got there, you won't believe they were not sure if it was an ectopic or not. Because once really? again, the, yeah, because it wasn't showing in my womb immediately, right. but it was also not showing in the tube. Okay. So they're checking the tube area, but they couldn't see any signs of it there either. So it was a very tricky one. And it was one that they felt that they wanted to terminate the pregnancy immediately. But I refused. I felt yeah. like they should be able to identify where this... Um, baby is growing. Mm -hmm. So they, the, the, the trade-off we had was I had to be admitted almost immediately. And it was now the week of my birthday. So I was admitted on May 11th and my birthday is May 16th. 
that was in 2013. So they said they will have to keep me under observation since I'm not allowing them to terminate the pregnancy. So from the 11th to the 16th, we were checking every day to see if the growing baby was in the womb or in my, in my tube. It just was not clear. It wasn't clear. So they allowed me to have my birthday. So my birthday was spent in the hospital. And by May 17th, the very next day, they just opened the curtain to my bed space and were like, they, they in fact wanted to sign me off as maybe clinically mad that I can't make a decision because they felt I was being too sentimental over yeah. what they felt is dangerous. So here's the thing. Even if the ectopic is not showing in the obvious place like a tube or, you know, surrounding area, it is still constituted as an ectopic because it's not in your womb. Right. They can't find it. So the mere fact that you can't find it in the womb is already a danger point. Do you understand? Yeah. So in their view, though they can't find it, they want to go into it to go and look for it. <laughs> so it's exactly. danger anyways. Yeah. Well, I kept being a woman of faith that don't worry, God will make the baby show yeah. in the womb, in the right place. So on the 17th, the, um, more senior doctors, they signed off that I wasn't allowed to make that decision, that they, it's a life and death decision now, you know and everything but by then i'd made peace with the whole matter i was ready i was tired of being in the hospital and just yeah. waiting you know so i was like it's fine they should go in so they went in they removed they removed the other fallopian tube then they were able to find the growing fetus it was it was kind of hiding behind a certain wall or certain intestine it was really weird so it was hiding behind certain things was hiding so they were happy they still went in and got rid of it because it shouldn't have been where it was so that was now the third ectopic and on that day in may 2013 i became tubeless i had no fallopian tubes left so the only option to get pregnant was now ivf like proper ivf you know yeah. um no before they were saying just do the ivf anyways even with your semi semi good tube but yeah. now there was no other choice you know and for those that don't understand um ivf is actually good for me in the sense that it's um it doesn't need your tubes you know they mirror the tube like environment outside your body you know so ivf literally is kind of for people like me who yeah. don't even have fallopian tubes it doesn't mean you can't get pregnant it's just they will have to mirror all of that outside of the body. The three to five days of um, implanted, um, a fertilized egg traveling would mm. happen in a tube-like environment in a lab, mm. but not in your body anymore, you know. So you'll still release eggs, you know, but it's just those eggs will be there waiting to be fertilized, but they can't be anymore. So they will extract those eggs, fertilize them, wait three to five days to see the best eggs mm -hmm. that they want to put back in you, you know. So that was now my only option left. So December of 2013 was my first IVF try and um, it didn't work at all, zero. Then April 2014, we had frozen some of the eggs at the time where we were doing it in Dubai. They didn't okay. let you freeze embryos anymore. We couldn't oh. freeze embryos. You could only freeze eggs. They had just literally stopped it the year before for some legal reasons or, you know. So, but well, thankfully, because we had eggs, I didn't have to do the full IVF process. I just did the frozen egg transfer. Right. So my husband still needed to come in to give um, a sperm. Whereas if it was the embryo that was frozen, it would be like a frozen embryo transfer as opposed to the egg. So um, instead of the whole one month of, I, IVF process it became like more like a one and a half week because okay. it's not you know they're not starting from the beginning but that also didn't work you know then I now went for a third um, IVF and that was that same year October 2014 of that year they the same clinic I was using in Dubai they had a clinical trial that they were doing where they would they called it mechanical mechondria removing of your cells first 
okay. where they will now take from the cells and mix it with the IVF. When you so you first do that process before now coming for an actual IVF. But what okay. these people didn't know was they didn't know the healing time and the healing process because it was all new. So okay. I was literally giving myself to be a guinea pig. Mm. You know, that's how it was, as if I was a guinea pig. So, um, I, um, yeah, so my healing process was slower than they anticipated. So let's say I wanted to do the IVF in November of that year, like a month after the mini operation they did to take the cells. I couldn't because I was still very sore. So we now waited till December again of that 2014 and did the IVF and it still did not work. You know, so I was so deflated by that point because mm -hmm. the surgery I did to take the cells out was so painful. You know, it was a painful recovery, really painful, really, really bad. So it just felt like, why am I doing all this and, and for what, you know? Yeah. So I had made up my mind that in 2015, I wasn't going to try for a child anymore. I just wanted to relax mm -hmm. and travel mm -hmm. and just have fun. You know just chill out you know and since i'm a fashion designer i focused on fashion shows you know i was just becoming more creative just taking time out for myself but um, that same year i had given an interview earlier that year i think march of 2015 it was not till around may of that 2015 that bella niger carried that interview wow. and um it, so it became a big deal by, by the time, because it was Paul's TV Africa that did the interview around March, but it was not till when Bella and I just shared it that it became a big deal. Yeah. So, so many women were moved. So many were moved at my courage of speaking up, because at the time, I didn't yet have children. I yeah. didn't know if I would ever have children, you know. And I was speaking from a place of peace to everybody you know that interview is one that can help you in you know changing careers waiting on god for different reasons mm -hmm. it's not only about children you know because at different points in our lives we always have to wait for something you know so it's the same principles so i i um, spoke openly at that interview on my journey everything and i told them that i was going to just live my life because you can't live your life based on things you can't control. Right. If you can't control those variables, you have to live exactly. it alone. Go and live your life based on the things you can control, things you can start. Just leave all the ones you can't control alone. Go, just keep depressing you. So that became my mantra. That was in 2015. So um, people from around the world started calling me in Nigeria, suggesting different IVF clinics and some trials I could do. So I was made to do um, like a test to see how much killer cells were in me, oh, yeah. the stuff of killer cells. Mm -hmm. So I did that, paid a lot of good money for yeah. those tests. I did it in the UK, so expensive. Did it in the UK. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and um, when, um, when the results came out, they said I had high killer cells. They said they were going to have to do some Mayo treatment before I did the actual IVF. And that year, 2015, that year, around summertime, so maybe from August, September, October, the exchange rates just went crazy on all of us. So yeah. I couldn't afford to go and do IVF in the UK anymore. I just could not because the plan was to go and do it in the UK. So it took me till 2016 to decide that I wanted to try doing a cycle in Nigeria. And... When I came up with that decision, it was actually one that I tell people I had literally had enough and I just wanted to do one in Nigeria. And if it wasn't going to work, I was going to look into surrogacy, adoption, and other ways right. of becoming a parent because I'd had enough, you know. Um, in that same 2015, I'd done other tests. I'd done other things to, to check myself. Um, mm. I've forgotten the name, I, I threw what they call something to just check your warm environment and you know, and none oh, of the that scratching thing and the, no, the scratching. scratching that, okay, I did the scratching when I was ready to do the actual, okay. but right. before that one, they had done just a general et, et, um, et, etroscopic, uh, etroscopy, etroscopy, 
hysteroscopy, hysteroscopy. Right. That's it. Yeah. Just you know, for them to just see Check, what's yeah. really happening. Yeah. And they couldn't find anything out of place. You know. So I don't so I felt like I'd done too many things. Yeah. You know, whether you're being sedated to do it, just so many hostel vis visits. So I'd actually had enough. So by that 2016, I had made up my mind that that was going to be my last IVF. I had just, I was ready for it to be the last. And, um, and yeah, and God, as God will have it be, that was the only IVF that ever worked, you know? So it, it went through, then I found out I was having twins, then found out it was even a boy and a girl, Amazing. you know? And, um, and, that, and that was it, that was it. Um, I'm so, firstly, I'm so sorry about your losses, the ectopic pregnancies. I mean, you hear of one, but to actually have three. Wow. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. she, you're an exceptionally strong woman. You know, it's three ectopic pregnancies and then losing both tubes as well. Because a part of you just feels like, like you said, the first time IVF was um, proposed to you, you knew that you could still get pregnant naturally. But then to have yeah. both tubes taken out and knowing that you have to depend on IVF now it makes it even so even harder, right? Because you might harder. just think, you know, that means I can't do what my body's supposed mm -hmm. to do. And so that, to that do. yeah, mm -hmm. that must have been very difficult as well. We're going through all of that, and congratulations. <laughs> on, what what kept you going during the journey? Because I mean, it seemed like so much going on. Did you have other friends going through something similar or? How did you find support during that time? Well, yes, um, I had, yeah, I had a few friends that were going through similar things, but theirs was not ectopics, just maybe unexplained infertility, right. you know, you okay. just don't know why. You're. Then some of them, um, irregular period, you know, mm -hmm. you know, women have different reasons why yeah. they might not be getting pregnant. So. One way or the other, we, I had friends that hadn't had children yet, and it was based on fertility issues, you know. So I guess that, that helps. I wasn't feeling so lonely yeah. in, that, in that regard, you know. Then I always kept myself busy. You know, I'm, I'm a bit of an extrovert, so I like going out a lot, hanging with family and friends. I, I really throw myself deep into such hangouts. Yeah. So, yeah, I was, I was able to cope with keeping myself busy. Amazing. And what role did faith play during your whole waiting time? I know you mentioned that you're Christian and how, what role did yeah, faith play? Um, so for me, I started studying the Bible on chapters to do with women who went through infertility. Yeah. And um, that, that, that was a turning point in my life because it, it clearly showed me that People had been through all of this, you know, centuries ago. Yeah. And at the time, God just gave them miracle babies and things like that. But science and technology had moved on so much that God could still give us those miracle babies through science. Yes. You know, um, because we all know that IVF doesn't work for a lot of people. Yes. So the fact that it worked for me was still my own miracle that God wanted to use science to produce. You know, so exactly. I was just always steadfast and firm on his word, you know, that when he's ready, he'll do it because his time is always the right time, always. Yeah. You know, it's just unfortunate that human beings, we're counting it year by year, but he doesn't count it that way. He doesn't see our age in that way, sure. you know. So, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. And would you say infertility changes as a person? Um, not at all. I mean, <laughs> you should be able to ask a lot of my friends. Um, it didn't change me for ba bad and it didn't change me for good. I remained, I remained okiki, my true self. You know, I'm bubbly, I'm out there, I love people, I love to love, you know. So I don't feel there was anything, if at all, anything. It changed me to be someone more vocal, but I was already vocal. So I don't feel it changed. It just made me put myself out there to help people who won't speak up. You right. Know. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. And did it, yes. did infertility? Would you say infertility had any impact on your relationship with your husband? Um. Yes, I would say it, it did. 
I would say it did because I was not, um, was like, should I say sexually interested, active anymore. Though I was still living my life having fun, but, but the whole sensual sexual department was just yeah. dead for a long time. Dead, dead, dead. I didn't want to know about it because I felt like if we we're going to sleep with each other, it's not going to turn into a child. So, yeah. you know, like it just was not registering with me again um, the the importance of, you know, being intimate in the marriage. All that bit yeah. was really, really tampered with. Really, really, yeah. yeah. It, wasn't, it wasn't a good time. It wasn't yeah. a good time. And if it really does that, it, it, yeah. it's, it's, it, because mm-hmm. again, like you said, when, when things that you want are not happening, it puts a lot of pressure on the relationship. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. So hopefully speaking more about it and letting people know will let us know to seek help when we can and just to ensure there's always communication um, mm-hmm. to prevent any form of distance during that whole um, journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in that yeah. cycle that worked in Nigeria, do you think you did anything differently? Um, yeah, the main thing that stood out was the endo- endometrium scratching that they ah. did. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the only thing I've done differently compared to other IVFs. So it might have played a big role in it. Because they, they do the scratching based on the fact that I've done three that had failed and there had been no okay. sign of a pregnancy at all. So they felt that that could help. There's the way they explained it. You know, I don't know all these medical terms. Okay. But maybe the scratching creates a form of wound-like thing that can attach right. to, the, okay. you know, to the embryo when it comes in here. Yeah. Okay, so you didn't eat any pineapples and put your legs no, up for days. <laughs> None of that. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. And I know, like we said a couple of times here, that you're very vocal, um, yeah. especially in Nigeria where people don't speak about infertility. You've done that so many times and in so many interviews, yes. you, you've come out and spoken about it. You've also spoken about the fact that you got your twins through IVF which in many cases people still hide from as well. Uh, yes, we do. How have people connected with you? Do you find lots of people reaching out to you, just also acknowledging what you've said and also sharing their own experiences with you? Has it been positive? Yeah, I mean, um, when the twins were first born, they were born November 2016. Mm-hmm. In that period, once, once people found out that I had given birth, yeah. A lot of people started reaching out for me to encourage them, sharing their own IVF stories, you know, and asking for tips on how they could cope with a failed IVF because we need more support and books on how to cope with a failed IVF. You know, yeah. there's, there's just not much enough support on it. Yeah, exactly. you know? And um, so, yeah, I was able to be there for many strangers because I didn't know a lot of this. I met them on Instagram. A number of them went on to have their own kids. Someone even a um, twin, you know. Yeah. So it's not bad. Yeah, it's, it was. It was good. It was good that people felt comfortable enough yeah. Yeah. to reach out to. Yeah. Wonderful. Definitely. Thank you. And what is one piece of advice you'll give your younger self, looking back now, uh, before Okiki got married? Mm-hmm. Looking back now, I will tell my younger self to just keep focusing on God and faith and realizing that, you know, (laughs) all good things come to those who wait, definitely. I'm a living testament of that. And telling myself to focus more on maybe business ventures, making money, you know, like really establishing myself more, focusing more on that than the amount of time I faced depressing myself and focusing on oh when would this child come a lot of that time could have been way more productive so that i could be a you know millionaire in dollars why not yeah, but amen. i took so much more crucial time i took so much crucial time waiting and watching on the whole child thing and that time could have been spent on how to grow a business or do a new venture you right. know well said so, yeah and is there any book you That's advise well, so my youngest that's one. Mm-hmm. Any book you advise someone dealing with infertility to read that you read that um, was very helpful? Yeah, I, I, I read all the, um, should I say, the books on wait, The Waiting Room by Yewande oh, yeah. okay. uh, Zakios. Yeah. yeah. 
yes um it was it was always a beautiful read i don't know if on volume four now or so maybe three or four or more i don't know if she stopped writing them but the, the old ones will still be available and they'll always be useful for anyone anytime yes. going through that would say them experience you definitely know. thank you yes us. And as Thank a wrap up, <laughs> any words of encouragement or hope for other people, a person knowing or couple dealing with infertility? Hmm. I feel like I want to tell all couples going through this that they are the real OGs, you know, they are the real stars, the real yeah. most valuable players because a lot of couples, so many, they show up to their friends, families, with children, you know, attending those events. I know yeah. the mixed emotions that you go through on a day-to-day -day basis, yet you keep your smile up, you keep your mind right so that you have that right energy around these people, yeah. you know, because you don't want to make them feel uncomfortable about your situation because sometimes they don't know how to be there for you yeah. and vice versa, you know. So... It's, um, it's an interesting one, but I feel couples can just change their focus to what they can control, what is in your immediate environment that you can day-to-day -day enjoy with each other. Yeah. You know, are you wine drinkers? Are you jazz lovers? Are you art and paint lovers? Find that common interest to keep bonding on and keep establishing and developing that bond and relationship. Because even when the children come, that if you're solid like that, then you'll be good parents. They would enjoy you as parents. But if you've spent all that period fighting, that's why a lot of people, when kids come, they now separate or divorce because it was almost inevitable. It was leading in that direction. Yeah. You know, if you're not being, being communicating with each other well, going on your date nights, even you need to even, you should even enjoy more date nights even before you are yeah. meant to be doing one because you have kids. Maybe you should do it three times. Like, just li really live your life to the fullest, you know. And in the process of throwing yourself genuinely into that, you can just come and have the kids naturally anyways. Exactly. You know, so many miracle stories like that, that when your body finally just relaxes and the mind has forgotten you're looking for kids, that's when you now get the child. Because you've even forgotten you cared for it, right. you know. So, yeah, they should just spend that period bonding more and enjoying find out what it is you both constitute as enjoyment and enjoy it enjoy it with each other well said yeah thank you so much okiki you've been thank you so for having me. yeah it's been so inspiring having you and you've inspired me you've inspired so many people in nigeria all, all over africa and across the world very You're vocal and you know speaking out in nigeria in black communities letting people know that infertility doesn't define you and letting people know the reality that can happen to people. Just, just encouraging other exactly. people. Thank you so much for doing that. Thanks for joining us this week on the Fertility Conversations podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a five-star rating and subscribe. Follow us on Instagram at Fertility Conversations. If there are any topics you would like to have discussed, please send an email to fertilityconversations at gmail.com. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode. Thank you again for listening. Take care of yourself and do stay hopeful.